kind of looks sus. Oh, uh, okay. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm doing something that's very exciting because I don't usually do it. I feel like everybody had like this like baking part of quarantine where they all made bread and stuff. I didn't do that. I went straight from the sewing to the reading, you know. Today, I'm gonna bake some brownies while talking about my favorite books of 2020 because I don't know. Brownies are gonna be good. They were $2. <laughs> so I ranked these actually. I ranked my books. I preheated the oven because I am What's the word? Responsible. King spray. Vegetable oil. Yes. Eggs. Yes. Step one. Heat. I did that. Grease bottom of pan. I feel like you shouldn't grease it this early, but since she said it, I'll do it. While I'm greasing, let's go to number 10 on the list. Number 10, The Mistake by L. Kennedy. Listen, don't click off. This was a top 10 book because I was in a complete state of isolation, loneliness, pain, suffering at the beginning of quarantine. I did not feel like myself. I felt like I was on a different planet, not having fun at all. Feeling that the books gave me when I read them, they were <laughs> not that good. They really were just romance, whatever, sports romance, hockey. Um, I don't know anything about hockey, by the way. The feeling that it gave me was just like the first bout of quarantine. Also college admissions were coming out there, so I was just getting my ego blown like every single day. And so this book was like the first time in quarantine that I was like laughing and like having fun and like enjoying something. And so that's what I got out of it. Also, John Logan, the love interest is just a very sweet boy. Is that too much? <laughs> Uh, I picked to be The Secret History by Donna's Heart. Now, I picked this book as number nine because this was my first intro to what dark academia is. Really enjoy The Secret History because I enjoy seeing rich, privileged people fail, and this book is full of that. So, The Secret History is about this guy named Richard who goes to a fictional New England university and he wants to be part of this Greek ancient Greek uh, language course and there's only like five people in the class and the professor is really mysterious and he realizes that all five of the people in the class suck but he is like too entranced with them to care and so he basically gets sucked into their life that is very gilded um honestly all of them suck a murder on the first page and then it's i guess like a frame story like you're kind of like um the first page is kind of like a you're wondering how i got here and here's how i got here Dark Academia, as in aesthetic, a lot of the stories surround um, Greek mythology, Greek tragedy, Greek stuff. They study Greek tragedies, but then their lives become a Greek tragedy because of the hubris that they have, because they think that because they're so smart, they're above failure, they're above the law, they're above morality. And so you're going through Richard's eyes, who is a completely unreliable narrator, and you're just watching a bunch of white people fool around in Vermont for a few months. I gave it four out of five stars. I think it's a very divisive book in the way that people either love it or hate it, and I can absolutely see Either way, everyone in the book sucks though. Like, on bottom line, even Camilla, who I enjoy, even Francis, who I enjoy, like you all, complicit, stupid. Ronnie mixes in the bowl. I hate cracking eggs. Oh, it went into the drawer. You're kidding. Ew, 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 ew. No, no, ew, ew, ew. I'm not being not enjoying this. Number eight of my favorite books of this year. Number eight is The Alchemist by Paul Coelho. Coelho? Coelho. So I picked that as number eight, and I picked that because, well, okay, if I'm being very honest, I actually think that the story itself is a little bit boring. The overall message of it and the quotes that come out of it are really special to me, I think, because I read it, um, or I listened to it on an audiobook, like right when I was about to graduate high school, and I thought that themes were very relevant to my life at that current moment. It was about, you know, going on your own journey, finding out who you are, discovering what love in your life. Um, and that just like really hit very personally. I'm kind of not necessarily a shy person, but I don't really like taking risks. And so me starting this YouTube channel, me starting my blog, like those are really big risks. And I like was opening myself up to criticism, was opening myself up to other people's eyes. And so this book just hit very personally in the way that Santiago was going through the journey. Like, so I actually took some quotes from The Alchemist to further my point, you know, cause this is a literary essay, right? 
I like the quote that goes, when we love, we always strive to become better than we are. When we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better too. People think this sounds corny, but like it's not corny to like show love to people. It's not corny to be nice to people. The other quote that I like that I picked out was, remember that wherever your heart is, there you will find your treasure. Well, in the book, you know, Santiago is looking for the alchemist, but he also just finds such great and rich things along the way. It's not about the, the destination, it's about the journey. And I think that's true. Tres cucharadas o peras de agua. Okay. okay. Number seven is Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. Now, okay, so I was recommended this book by my dad, who is a big science fiction fan. Not necessarily the story itself that I like, because honestly, I found it tedious and a little bit boring at parts. The whole concept of what we define as humanity, what we define as being normal. First of all, I just think that <laughs> humanity kind of sucks. The book became like a pretty big uh, icon of counterculture in the 60s, I'm fairly certain, and I think that that occurred because there's a lot of commentary on like sex and money and morality and um, politics. I feel like a lot of people should read it now because the way that the human humans treated Valentine Michael Smith was just really interesting because they acted superior to him because of his upbringing. Even though he's fully human, he just lived a different way on Mars. And so, um, you know, I don't want to spoil too much because I think that the way that I discovered it was very interesting. My dad wouldn't tell me what the book, you know, was going to explore. And so I feel like that's a good way to go about it. Um, it helps you grok it. You get it. You, you, you get it if you get it. Number six is The Namesake by Junpo Lahiri. I originally read this in, early, or in late 2019. So I reread it this year to finally kind of get it. So the namesake is about this guy, Gogol, um, and he comes from an Indian family. I think he's first generation American and he hates his name basically because it's not an Indian name. His parents named him after Nikolai Gogol who was a Russian author. And so it's just about him kind of, it's about Gogol growing up and understanding what's in a name, the importance of a name, the importance of identity and self. I think that Jim Lahiri is a wonderful author. So, we're just raw dogging it. Number five is another reread. Question to put water in this. Kill me now. So number five was The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Listen, I love Oscar Wilde. People in the Victorian era were like, you're gay. And he was like, true. Oh yeah, no, this is looking good now. Oh yeah. Picture of Dorian Gray is about this guy named Dorian Gray. Super narcissistic, super annoying. He basically makes a Faustian deal with the devil. Um, to maintain his eternal youth, basically in exchange for his soul. He gets this portrait of himself, and every time Dorian Gray does a crappy thing to someone, the painting starts to get super ugly to reflect his soul, basically. Um, have not ever seen the movie, but the guy who plays him in the movie is super pretty, so I will watch it. I really enjoy it because, um, like I said, the Victorian era sounded super lame. Aestheticism is a really big part of this book, how art should just be loved for the sake of art. Like there doesn't have to be a deeper meaning behind it. And that was like a really big thing in the Victorian era. Everything had to have some type of lesson about morality. And Oscar Wilde was like, no, things can just be pretty because they're pretty. Like, why do you have to make everything so deep? Number four of my favorite books of this year is The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. So this book is a new release of 2020. Excuse me, I just burped. I read it so quickly and enjoyed it so much that I just feel like I'd be lying if I said it wasn't on my favorites. Very similar to Knives Out. This like billionaire who dies and basically screws with his family for <laughs> a while. He leaves all of his money to this girl, Avery, who has no connection to any of them, doesn't live in the same state as them, and basically has to figure out why she was given all of the money at the same time as the family's figuring out why she got all of this money. Riddles and puzzles that he gave them through his farewell letters, through his will, through like the house where there's like trap doors and, and hidden rooms and all this stuff. I felt super big brained when I figured out like the ending. That kind of looks sus. It's in, it's in the bata. I'm not having fun anymore. Number three on the list is A Clockwork Orange by, oh God, who wrote this? Anthony Burgess, yup. About this kid named Alex, who lives in a dystopian version of England. And Alex is an absolute psycho 
crazy person. Absolutely deranged, ultra violent, um, crazy. He's 15, right? And they are sexually assaulting people, they're robbing people, beating up old people, breaking into houses, like it's really wild. Fox gets caught one day and he does serve prison time, but he gets taken out of his prison time early to be part of this new training where they basically desensitize you to violence and try to like change your personality. I'm sure you've seen the iconic picture where his eye eyeballs are um, strapped open. Like you see it, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I'm fairly certain I gave it five stars. And you know why? I gave it five stars because by the end of it, I felt genuinely bad for Alex. It's like, oh, I don't want anyone to have to go through something like that, you know? to be shown such traumatic things over and over again until you cannot stomach it. I had to like pause the audiobook and I was like, am I feeling bad for someone who literally killed someone and like has raped multiple people that I've heard of? Like there's been more. A talent to craft a character that well that we feel bad for them regardless of what they've done. And so this book makes you question your own morality because it's like how far is too far in punishment for someone who's done awful things. So, you know, that's when you start thinking about stuff like the death penalty and stuff like that. It's that interesting slippery slope. Like an interesting fun fact that I read about this is that Anthony Burgess said that he was kind of disgusted with how entertained and how much like pleasure he took in writing Alex's crimes. Because Alex, you know, is a kid, but he uses slang for everything that he does. So like when you're listening to it or reading it, it's kind of, you can easily miss like the awful heinous things that he's doing because he takes such joy in it and he uses such like jubilant language. And so that's another thing that's like kind of disturbing and I can see why this book has been banned. Number two isn't a book, it's actually a short story, but I just loved it so much that I feel the need to put it on here. So I read Resetative by Toni Morrison. Let's kid key about this. Going over here. Like as directed in Shark. 24 minutes? So Resetative about these two girls who met in an orphanage <coughs> when they were younger. So Twyla and Roberta are two girls who met in an orphanage when they were um, children, and <coughs> they both have w parents who were unable to take care of them, obviously, but their moms were still alive. It's just, it's from Twyla's perspective, and she's talking about growing up with Roberta, and you can kind of tell that she's like resentful of Roberta because Twyla is very bitter about life, her mom, was kind of a deadbeat. She thinks that Roberta is starry-eyed about life, and so she's very resentful of Roberta's positivity. Interesting part about this whole story. So Twyla talks about how one of them is black and one of them is white, but as they grow up, it is very difficult to decipher which one is black and which one is white because they both come from uh, poor backgrounds. So they're both orphans, but have experiences that could be related to either of the races. This is happening in like the 60s or 70s, I'm pretty sure. You don't ever get an answer and there's been a lot of speculation on who is who. Yes! Ooh! Yes, sir. No, oh, I just liked it because of the commentary that I talked about, but also how they just keep coming back to each other um, throughout different parts of their lives. Like, oh, this is not cooked. That is bad. Maybe I'm not good at this. Someone will ask you what you think about a book and it's like, well, what do you think? And I hate that question usually, but I think this one spawns very good. Don't know why it's not cooking. Oh, it's hot. It's still ooey gooey. Give me a minute. Okay, try this again. <laughs> Two more minutes. Okay, I just took it out again. Number one, my favorite book of 2020 that I've read. It's Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. So Lovecraft Country is about a guy named Tick who basically finds out that he's got lineage at this crazy lodge full of white supremacists, and he's a black guy. And this is a 1950s Chicago Jim Crow segregation era, right? <laughs> Last of this line because of a slave of the first owner who raped her. You know, details. The point of it is the owner of the lodge, like the current owner of the lodge, has a son named Caleb. And Caleb, they're all into like magic and like um, alchemy. And so Caleb basically kind of inserts himself in Tick's life after the lodge disintegrates, long story. <laughs> deal with the supernatural and magic in 1950s Chicago. Um, and Caleb is there kind of just ruining everyone's life one, one at a time. That's why the TV show I think is so wonderful because it follows the plot pretty closely. There are some differences, but I actually enjoyed the book better. Mixes 
supernatural monsters with the real life monsters of racists and white people. Loved it because of the commentary on like who's really a monster here. It threw me off guard that it was written by a white guy. It's so hot. I cut them up so they look ugly, but it's in a heart pan. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. This was fun. Um, hope to see you in my next one. Bye, besties.